Hello, this is Hamlet from the Guild Elitist Jerks on the server Melganis, narrating a challenge mode run of Scarlet Monastery. This zone has a strangely cramped starting area. You can see us kind of crammed in there and you can't see much of anything. Makes it a pain to use a feast. I'm putting Symbiosis on the Elemental Shaman here because Solar Beam will be useful at a number of packs. We've also used a Rune Scroll of Fortitude, which is a handy item to remember if your group doesn't have a fort buff. For this first pack, all of the DPS pre-pot and burst down the pile of skulls, which is what stops zombie spawns. Other than that, the pack has a Scarlet Flamethrower and two Scarlet Centurions. It's the only time in the zone we're going to meet those kinds of mobs. The Flamethrower has a Conal AoE that's randomly targeted, but that's not terribly threatening. The tank can take a lot of damage as you start here. I throw Iron Bark on him, really only because I know that the next time I'm going to use it is the giant trash pack that's more than two minutes away. As soon as that pack is mostly dead, I follow the tank down the hallway. If you hug this left wall here, at most all you're going to pull is one zombie from the left side, which is no big deal. If you aggro the pack of centurions across the hallway, you have to reset. Here the tank's goal is to get these frenzied spirits clumped as quickly as possible before we pull Thalanos. So he uses Dizzying Haze to pick them up in a way that doesn't do damage. I use Typhoon to help out. And then once they're clumped, he leg sweeps them. I also drop an Ursul's Vortex here to keep them from moving while he pulls the boss. And then at that point, the DPS is there and starts laying into them. The Frenzied Spirit have a buff which stacks as they take damage. It increases their damage dealt and reduces their movement speed. So once they take in a few hits, they're rooted but do incredible amounts of damage. Unfortunately, our Death Knight wasn't here today. In some of our practice runs, we'd worked out a scheme where he would control undead a spirit once it had a large amount of stacks on it. We would tank the boss right next to it, and it would cut the fight time roughly in half. Once everything's stabilized, I pop Heart of the Wild and start DPSing. This fight's not very threatening. The group is already bloodlusted. I even use a DPS potion here because I don't have a need for any other potion, and I can contribute about 100,000 DPS for the duration. The only thing for a healer to really watch for on this fight is Evict Soul. He casts it on a cooldown, and so if you watch for it, you can dispel it before the first tick. That way you get no soul spawned and nobody has to worry about them and can just keep DPSing. Worth noting, this group's DPS is good, it has to be in order to be doing challenge modes, but it's not excellent. We're missing a few buff synergies, two of our DPS aren't getting melee haste, and the elemental shaman isn't getting curse of elements. And of the zones we've done so far, this one wound up giving the narrowest cushion on time, but it was still totally doable with some well-practiced execution. Most of what we had to practice was the trash sequence right after this boss, which is the hardest in the zone. First, right through the closed door after the boss are two yellow judicators. We pulled them in order to meet our enemy count, and also because it's actually kind of hard to fight the pack of six that patrols right behind them without pulling them during the fight. And if you had a group that could handle it, particularly with a Death Knight tank, you would probably just pull it all at once for speed. But the key is that Judicators do only one significant thing, they stun your tank. And between these two Judicators and the one that's in the patrol, the Monk tank getting stunned all the time is disastrous. Whenever we start a large hard trash pull, pretty much the first thing that has to happen is that the Monk tank leg sweeps them the moment everything is in range. And if the first thing that happens is that a Judicator runs up and stuns him, then in the three seconds before he can cast that leg sweep, he's just going to be dead. So what made this pull work for us is killing the two Judicators fully, even though it means we now have to wait a while for this pack to patrol back, and then an Earth Elemental tanks the one Judicator in this pack. And then as soon as they're in range, we can start our stun rotation cleanly. There's a leg sweep. In a few seconds, you'll see a Capacitor Totem pop. Our Shaman dropped that. There it is, right as the leg sweep started, and that makes it time out perfectly, and now he uses his Solar Beam right when that ends. And by the time all of these change of things wear off, we're down to three mobs, and everything is totally safe. And done this way, the pull was actually easy, but we spent quite a lot of time working out an exact procedure. On most of our practice runs, that pull was much more stressful for me healing it. We were even doing things like CCing half the pack at first, that we later decided simply took too long. This is where we invis pot. Our potion cooldown from Thalnos just ended about five seconds ago. Our shaman made a fortuitous discovery here, which is that the earth elemental invises even if you forget to dispel him. But if you can do that trash pack all at once, and in about 50 seconds or less after you finish the first boss, you probably don't want a DPS pot on him, or else you'll be waiting for your invis pot cooldown. When you get here, you have to see where Brother Korloff is and whether he can be safely pulled. We straight up wasted 15 seconds to bad luck here, which is unfortunate given how tightly timed this run is. As long as I'm within a few steps of the group during the invis pod, I basically told the hunter or the tank or anyone who pops out of invis to just pull him if it's possible, and then I would get there in time. This boss is pretty easy. You have a cramped space to fight him in because you can't aggro any of these packs of fanatics that are standing nearby, but with some careful positioning, you don't have to move much at all. 
He always firestorm kicks at the furthest person away, so we have one DPS stand there at the back to always take that, and the tank stands over near the waterfall itself to aim blazing fists off in a safe direction where he still has enough room to run out of range. The only other positioning note is that at 50%, the boss starts leaving a trail of fire everywhere he goes, so as long as he only moves between these two points where that range DPS is and where the tank is, then those fires will always drop in one spot, and it's easy for everyone else to stand in one spot and not have to worry about them. Brother Korloff does proportionally increased fire damage as his HP gets lower, but even near the end of the fight, his firestorm kick isn't going to one-shot the ranged DPS that's there taking it, so you can top him off at your leisure in between kicks. Our Red Pally was often even diving into the kick for a tick or two just to continue DPSing. You really want to burn this guy down as quickly as possible, there's not much else to it. I can't really help out that much because Heart of the Wild is down from the first boss. I do keep Fairy Fire up on him, which is something I've been trying to do in every boss this run because I know how tight the timing is going to be. It's possible actually that I should have been the one standing at the purple marker and running in and out for Firestorm Kick, given how much downtime I have at this fight and the fact that the tank takes no damage during it. A pretty good benchmark is that you want to be finishing this guy and getting into the final room with six and a half to seven minutes left. There's a lot of trash in that room and you have to clear all of it because in challenge mode it aggro's when you pull Durand and white main. And the encounter with those two itself takes over three minutes. In general, single target DPS is pretty important in this zone because you spend over seven minutes of it just in combat with bosses. As this fight ends, the group has to run a very careful line between these two trios of fanatics into the final room. You can guide yourself a bit by the geometry of this fountain. There's kind of a little corner marking the exact center, and then same for the center of these stairs. In the final room itself, there are about five purifiers around the edges. There are two four packs, each with double fanatics, and then there are the two easy pulls in the back corners. So usually we start and immediately get the two static purifiers here on the left, and ideally this third one if it happened to be patrolling nearby. Purifiers are pretty annoying when they're parts of larger packs, but they're easy to fight on their own. They have a three second cast purifying flames, which is a heavy single target nuke, and a two second cast flame strike. Here we get behind on interrupts. You can see we start standing in flame strike, so I just just heal it all off with tranquility as we set up for the next pack. We don't want to move too far away from this location because we're going to be using this pillar to try to LOS the mobs over to us. We have CC'd one fanatic over where it stands. I've talked about judicators and purifiers already. Zealots aren't that threatening, but they cast a heal, so it's yet another thing where you have to watch interrupts or else you get badly slowed down. Fanatics are extremely hard-hitting melee mobs. They not only have an attack that spikes the tank for 200% melee damage, but they also have a buff that adds fire damage to all their attacks. So you can spend time purging it to help, but we found that it was easiest just to not fight two fanatics. If we had really needed to carve more time off of our run, we would have found a way to cut those CCs out of the procedure. But as will often happen when you're running challenge modes, the really ambitious things like learning to do that big trash pull earlier in this zone with no CC, we'll do at the beginning of the zone because it's easy to practice them repeatedly. And then at the end of the zone, especially any time after the invis pot portion, you're going to try to do things in the most controlled way because you're not going to have as many opportunities to practice it before your gold runs. And as you'll see, our route through this room winds up being a little sloppy. It was fine so far. While I was just talking, we finished off the two purifiers on the right side of the door and the one fanatic that had been CC'd, while the tank pulls this easy pull from around the corner. It's just a zealot and then a pack of initiates, which are low HP versions of zealots. As we start the final fanatic pack, yet again, one fanatic is repentanced. Before he had a ret pally in the group, I was rooting them, and we use the pillar and or silencing shot to LOS the purifier over to us to try to clump everything together. We also pulled this one Judicator because we weren't totally sure of the enemy count, and also because it can be kind of hard to avoid pulling while we're fighting right here anyway. The enemy count's not 100% consistent in this zone because of these Judicators that continually spawn and walk down the center of the final room. This is where we start being a little sloppy though, that Zealot from the pack in the corner is still alive and has gotten some heals off. It's pretty important to have a plan for each stretch of trash in a challenge mode, not just what order you're going to pull things in and when you're going to take combat breaks to drink and the like, but also when you're chain pulling, which are the important mobs to get down before you chain pull into the next pack. Here we know we're behind on time and we start DPS on this fanatic now that there are no other dangerous mobs left, but we're still spending time and energy dealing with interrupting the zealot from the pack and that one zealot that had still been alive from the pack at the corner. And probably if this had been a little smoother, we would not have gotten this last judicator that spawned, which as you'll see winds up being one extra mob over the enemy count. 
we have 37 enemies killed and there are four left alive, including that zealot running in from off camera. Because we were short on time and I thought it was fine on mana, I forewent my combat break halfway through this room. We've just been chain pulling straight from the beginning. As you can see, that may not have been the best idea. But then again, we did make it and I'm going to take a usual combat break and start an amber right before pulling the boss, which I can easily do for 10 seconds while the tank pulls the moment that he sees the amber go out because this boss doesn't do anything dangerous at the beginning. You can consider chain pulling that final pack into the boss or simply pulling the boss and the aggro automatically. The only thing to watch for is that the zealot in that pack will leave behind a spirit of redemption, so it's still best to either kill him away from the group or simply keep him CC'd throughout the entire fight if you don't need the enemy kill. We pulled this boss at just about 3.15 on the clock. That's a little bit less than you like. Be warned when you're planning out your timing that it's a very long encounter. In the first phase, Durand by himself doesn't really do much of anything. We all stay clumped up just to keep DPS uptime a little higher, especially when there are melee in the group. I consider using my Heart of the Wild here. I can do it now or at the end when we're back to just Durand by himself again, and I figure doing it later I might have a chance to overlap with Bloodlust a little more. Something to talk about at this fight is when you want to use your Bloodlust. You'll probably want it up after White Mane reses Durand when there are two targets to DPS, and you don't really want to cast it before then when there's just White Mane because that means that you're going to waste part of it while you're asleep. I should probably be DPSing a little more here. It's still worth something even without Heart of the Wild up. I have been remembering to keep Fairy Fire up on the boss. Something I was thinking about is actually for faster runs whether I could have considered just being in balance spec for both this boss and the previous one, Brother Korloff. High Inquisitor White Mane does have one important new ability. It's a one and a half second cast Dominate Mind, and if it goes off, then one party member is going to be mind controlled for 30 seconds, which is obviously a huge problem. So you have to make sure you know who's interrupting it. If at all possible, you can spare two interrupters assigned to be on that just to make sure that it never goes off while there's still one person who knows that they're doing the mass resurrections, which are easy to interrupt. White Mane's going to put everyone to sleep at just about 50%, and then as soon as they're both back up at close to full HP, we're going to be using all our DPS time at the most efficient part of the fight. The sleep lasts 10 seconds. Here I refresh my life bloom right before it happens so I don't have to spend any time putting it back up afterwards. So there's Arise My Champion, and immediately afterwards we have Bloodlust, and I also pop in a tree form just to make the healing as easy as possible. In reality, I should have DPSed a little more here while I had the advantage of Bloodlust. That's a kind of hard thing to know in challenge modes unless you've done a fight a bunch of times. We had only practiced this once or twice before, so I wasn't totally comfortable using Heart of the Wild while the tank was tanking both Durand and White Mane. I planned to use it while we were back down to just only Durand. With only a minute left here in the zone, though, I should probably have just overlapped Heart of the Wild, Bloodlust, and Tree Form to make it as easy as possible to heal the tank while contributing DPS. The Shaman is also using Ancestral Guidance to make healing as easy as possible. And as she's going down, I finish with Tranquility, not even because it's super necessary, but just to get a Tranquility hot stacked up on everyone, refresh Life Bloom, and then use Heart of the Wild and DPS out for the rest of the zone. Only around at this point do we really know we're going to make it. Remember, we lost some time earlier to Bad Luck, waiting for Brother Korloff and for the big trash pack earlier in the zone to patrol into pullable positions, so with better luck we could have had about 30 seconds leeway. Otherwise we would have had to go back and cut some CC out of our run and figure out how to keep the monk tank up through that entire giant first trash pack or pairs of fanatics here in this room. But fortunately here we got the time we needed even with the slightly slower approach. Thank you for watching.